thank you all for coming. And I'm sorry for the weather. I wish we could have had a prettier day, but I guess this will keep you all in here for the next four and a half hours. Um, so I'm Melissa Wood, and I um, uh, co-direct the Corrigan Women's Heart Health Program and help uh, lead our SCAD program at MGH. And I'm really thankful to all of you for venturing here, some of you from quite far away to join us. And you know, this is our fourth patient uh, engagement symposium. And you know, the first three were sort of small, maybe one and a half, two hours. And this one is going to have a lot of content for you. So certainly will we'll last until five o'clock. Um, we hope that you'll learn some new information. I think one of the things that we all recognize is that SCAD patients want to learn more. They want to know what's up to date and um, how will that change their management and, and the future. So hopefully um, you will be able to learn a lot today. We have, we're so fortunate to have some really expert speakers here. Um, Dr. Nandita Scott, who's uh, my co-director at the MGH um, Corgan Women's Heart Health Program, will start us. And, and she has a very particular interest in pregnancy and heart disease as well as SCAD. Uh, Dr. Sarah Sierras, also from MGH, will be speaking uh, after Nandita. And then we will have our crew from MGH Cardiac Rehab. We're so fortunate to have um, Maria Shea and Nancy McCleary here who have just led many of you through your recovery process. And I know how dearly you hold uh, that cardiac rehab process to your heart. Um, Jackie Saw, Dr. Saw from Vancouver, you know, really world-renowned um, SCAD researcher who just has published the largest series of SCAD um, patients to date. Um, we'll be here speaking, as will Dr. Esther Kim, also a world-renowned expert in both FMD and SCAD. Um, Catherine Kelly Leon, who founded SCAD Alliance, will be here. Dr. Um, Brad Dar is here from FMDSA. And then we're fortunate enough to have two patients here um, that will be sharing uh, their stories as well. Victoria Monroe, who is a um, life coach and SCAD survivor, is going to talk about her experience and her pathway to recovery. And Robin Harris at the end will be giving us some info on how she set up the New England Facebook group and just some of her observations on social media and the use of social media. I will be trying to facilitate answering questions throughout um, and I think Dr. Scott is actually in a little bit of a time crunch because she's also leading uh, CME on pregnancy and heart disease across uh, over at the um, Fairmont. So she's going to have to skedaddle over there when she finishes. So we'll get her started first. A couple comments. Um, use of social media. I was met with a mentor group this morning and was saying how valuable it is to, to follow Twitter and follow different SCAD investigators and different SCAD groups on Twitter. So MGH now has an at MGH SCAD. Um, I'm at Dr. Melissa Wood. She's at Nandita Scott. Um, and there's also at SCAD Alliance. Um, and most of the speakers will probably have their tag at the end of their talk. But it's, it's a great way to get information that's very up-to-date and credible. There will be links to peer-reviewed articles that you can open up and oftentimes like a you know, digestible take-home message at the top of the tweet. Um, you can also use hashtag um, SCAD Heart, hashtag MGH SCAD today while you're here to see what's trending um, on those topics. So please use social media. A big thank you to those who helped us organize this. Our summer interns, Francesca Ponzini and Shelley Mishra, as well as Dr. Youssef Ghazawi, who's our research coordinator. Our MGH research team, many of whom you've spoken to on the phone. Um, Shernette Wood, who is uh, my personal assistant and has answered phones many ha answered the phone many times when you've called in, and she's really you know took time off from her personal life to be here today to help us out, and we're so appreciative of that. We're also appreciative of the um, development office who helped pro provide us with name tags and other assorted things for this meeting. Um, some housekeeping details, if you parked at MGH, when you check out of the parking lot, make sure to tell them you were at this event and you get the discounted rate. It's $14. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get uh, free parking today, but with the Red Sox being in town and a lot of things going on, it's really hard to come by parking in downtown Boston. So 14 bucks is a steal. Now, Fenway Park, it's like 90 probably today. Um, for those of you who want to see this again, it's going to be recorded right now, and it will be available on YouTube and a link through our MGH website. And so we're very grateful to um, our uh, foundation funding to help us pay for not only this meeting today, but for uh, recording it and for developing our peer uh, mentor group as we go ahead. So we're very thankful, and our ongoing research as well. Um, I think without further ado, I'll get started. So Dr. Scott is going to talk about pregnancy, contraception, menopause, and SCAD. Nandita. Thank you, Melissa. 
So I just first want to take this opportunity. This is amazing that uh, all these people are here on a Saturday in Boston. Thankfully, it's raining to list, to learn more about this. Um, this is a team process, but really, Dr. Melissa Wood has really spearheaded this on behalf of our team. When we were in training, SCAD was really barely mentioned. Um, I'm sure there were some women who had you know heart attacks that. Um, we didn't know what was wrong because their artery on catheterization looked normal, but in retrospect, many of them probably did have SCAD. And Melissa's really taken it to heart to try to improve how to manage um, this group of patients So, and for bringing you all together today. So congratulations, Melissa. So um, I'm at Class Town right now um, co-directing our heart disease and pregnancy course, which is a unique collaboration between cardiology, maternal fetal medicine, and anesthesia. And it's really amazing to see the groups come together, because if you think about maternal mortality in the United States, we do worse than any other developed country in the world. So this is actually a national embarrassment. Um, so the, if you look at maternal mortality, which is defined as dying during pregnancy or the first year postpartum, um, it's 26 per 100,000 live births. And as you can see, we do worse in Canada, which is a you know, very similar country, uh, Denmark, Italy, a lot of the European countries. So we need to work on improving this statistic for our women. Now, um, a lot happens to our heart during pregnancy. It's actually quite amazing that so many women deliver babies without any consequences or any suggestion that their cardiovascular system is going through these amazing changes. And I'm not going to go through details of this, but the important thing to remember is that your cardiac output, which is in blue here, that starts going up very early in pregnancy, about 30 to 50% normal. And it goes up even more if you're having twins or triplets. And it starts at about six weeks when many people don't even know they're pregnant yet. And this is a huge burden on the cardiac system. Other things that happen is your heart rate goes up, um, your blood volume goes up. So there's these huge changes that happen even in the normal pregnant heart. And then you consider these changes and apply it to someone who has heart disease. You can imagine why women with cardiovascular disease have trouble first detected when they're pregnant. Now, the blood vessels are especially vulnerable during pregnancies. Um, this increased burden I talked about, so your, your cardiac output goes up when you're pregnant, but there's also hormones. So your, the progesterone that's released during pregnancy causes the normal fibers of your vessels to not really cross-link as well. The estrogen also affects this, and relaxin is released, um, which is a hormone that's released in pregnancy to loosen up your pelvis so you can get rid of the baby, but unfortunately it has bad effects on the blood vessels and makes them weak. And this is maybe one of the mechanisms why pregnancy and SCAD are associated. So pregnancy-associated heart attack um, is on the rise. Um, this is defined as um, having a heart event during pregnancy or the early postpartum period. It's uncommon, fortunately, but again, it is, going, it is increasing. And it's, but there's a higher risk in a pregnant woman of the same age versus a non-pregnant woman of the same age. And the etiologies include SCAD, which is why we're talking about this. So SCAD is the number one etiology why women have heart attacks during pregnancy. Atherosclerosis or plaque in the arteries, which is the normal way that we all think of heart disease, which is probably why SCAD's been undetected for many years, is we always thought that plaque was the reason why women or men had heart attacks. But there's other mechanisms. Coronary thrombosis, which is the blood clot in your arteries, can be another mechanism. Spasm of your arteries. And then stress cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome can be another reason why women have heart attacks during pregnancy. So this is a review um, of the, a contemporary review of 150 cases of heart attacks in our country between 2006 and 2011. And you can see here that the majority of them happen actually postpartum after you deliver the baby. And the next is third trimester with lesser effects in the, fir the first and second trimester. And it usually happens in older women, so 43% of them were over the age of 35. Anter MI means it's the front of the heart, which is a higher type of heart attack. And we have the common risk factors of obesity, preeclampsia, high blood pressure, diabetes, and smoking. And again, in this contemporary series by Dr. al Kayam, the number one cause why women have heart attacks during pregnancy are coronary artery dissection, the next most common being the plaque in the arteries. So this is what um, coronary arteries look like. This is, this is your heart underneath in the white gray. This is your aorta. And then the first branches of the aorta are the, the two coronary arteries that give blood supply to your heart muscle. So the left main comes off here and has two major branches, the left anterior descending, which goes along the front of the heart, and then the left circumflex, which goes along the side of the heart. And then you have the right coronary artery, which then goes along to the right side of the heart. And these arteries are on the surface of your heart, and then they get smaller and smaller and delve into your heart muscle to give your muscle blood supply. 
This is um, what we call an OCT, which is a catheter going into the actual artery, and this is a normal up here. This is the catheter here, and this is where the blood flows, and this is the inner lining of the artery, and you can see that it's intact all the way through. In this patient, which is one of my patients who had a heart attack during labor and delivery, you can see that she has normal intact lining here, but then she has this break in her artery. So this is a coronary artery dissection. So she tore her artery during labor. And then this is all blood clots surrounding that um, artery. So as I mentioned before, there's a more recent publication that came out looking at all the um, heart attacks in our country um, more recently. So I think it was up until 2014. And um, they had 4,471 cases of heart attacks during pregnancy. And unfortunately, it's going up over time. So it's not, a, it's not a high incidence, but this is the wrong direction. In 2018, we should be going the other way. Now, SCAD in pregnancy, um, again, SCAD is the most common cause why women have heart attacks during pregnancy. And interestingly, the vast majority of them happen postpartum in zero to five weeks. But even more importantly, most of them, which is in the red, occur in the first, first week after you deliver. So just because you deliver your baby doesn't mean that you're out of the woods in terms of developing a heart attack during pregnancy. Very less of them occur during the first and second and third trimesters. And we, they can occur for months after pregnancy, though I believe there's case reports of SCAD occurring up to one year postpartum. Especially with breastfeeding. Especially with breastfeeding, right. So there potentially is a relationship to breastfeeding, but it, we don't really know that yet. So the one important thing about pregnancy and SCAD is that um, when you have SCAD, during pregnancy, you're much sicker than women who have SCAD who don't have pregnancy. So unfortunately, you're more likely to have um, more weakening of the heart muscle function, more involvement of, multi, of more than one artery, or involvement of the less, left main, which is the most important artery. And pa patients who have SCAD um, during pregnancy, uh, based on Dr. Saw's recent um, large um, series, um, actually that was a risk factor for doing poorly was having SCAD and pregnancy together versus having SCAD unrelated to pregnancy. So the next, people always ask us, what's the right mode of delivery um, if, if I have heart disease and I'm pregnant? And really, most of the time, I do not tell my OB colleagues that we need to deliver by C-section. It's based on their decision making, based on obstetrical indications, based on the baby's breach or other issues um, on the mom and the baby. Um, it obviously dis it requires close interdisciplinary discussion between OB, cardiology, um, anesthesia, and nursing. But um, the majority of the time, we don't actually say that you have to have a C-section just based on cardiac indications. One thing the OBs can do is to minimize the second stage of labor. The second stage of labor is when your, your cervix is completely open and you're ready to push. They can minimize the amount of pushing by um, pulling the baby out with forceps or suc suction to minimize the amount of time that you actually have to uh, bear down. And one thing, important thing to remember is if you've, if you've had SCAD during pregnancy and you're on aspirin and Plavix, you cannot get an epidural if you're on Plavix for seven days, which is a problem because we don't want women to go into labor with a potential history of prior SCAD and not get an epidural because then the, the fluctuations of labor and delivery with pain and increased heart rate and blood pressure, we want to minimize that as much as possible. So vaginal delivery remains the optimal mode of delivery for, um, for basically all women with um, cardiovascular disease and pregnancy. Um, cesarean section increases the risk of infection, blood clots, um, has greater hemodynamic shifts, so more shifts in fluid in your body, um, and risk of surgical injury. There's no absolute consensus in the pregnancy world on who actually needs to have a C-section first, but we would consider it in someone who's on a blood thinner like warfarin because the, that, the baby gets fully thinned and we don't want the baby's brain to go through the vaginal canal while thin. Um, Marfan's, which is a disease of the aorta that um, the aortas can tear and rupture, that would be a situation where we might want to do a C-section because we don't want the patient bearing down too much. Um, patients already have tearing of the arteries, and someone with intractable heart failure that is really sick, we might just want to go in there and um, take the baby out. But the vast majority of the time, even in SCAD, uh, we would, the guidelines would suggest that we would go with a vaginal delivery. So um, pregnancy post-SCAD is such an important discussion, and I, know, I don't have an answer to that. It's such a, it's such a, obviously a very personal decision. Many of you or many SCAD survivors are young healthy women who want to expand their families and to say you cannot get pregnant, it's life-changing, right? Um, and, and um, you know, 
SCAD is, is more likely to happen in women. It's more likely to happen in women who are pregnant. So obviously, we wanna, we're want to we concerned about that re-exposure to the, the hormonal stimulus that pregnancy gives us, as well as the physical stimulus of the increased burden of pregnancy with blood volume, et cetera, and also the emotional effects of pregnancy. Um, and we know that there's a relationship between emotions um, and SCAD as well. There's, there's really a lack of preventative strategies. I know Dr. Tsa may mention that in one of her series, the use of beta blockers um, reduced the risk of recurrent SCAD. So if we had a patient who was pregnant on SCAD, we would probably use beta blockers to try to prevent a recurrence. Um, as I mentioned, patients with SCAD who are pregnant are sicker. And um, most recommend against a pregnancy once you've had SCAD, uh, but there's very little data to support this life-changing recommendation. And the other thing to remember is there are other ways to build a family, which you can always discuss if after discussion with your cardiologist and your obstetrician, you decide not to proceed with a pregnancy. There are other ways to family build. And again, patients need to be counseled carefully. And I would highly recommend that if you've had SCAD and do want to get pregnant, that you get managed in a tertiary medical center. And then again, careful planning of labor and delivery, considering the heart function, OB variables, and the presence of vascular disease like Marfan's or other um, vascular disorders. Um, so this is the best data we have on women getting pregnant after SCAD. So this is an eight-patient ser series. So in the cardiology world, an eight-patient series is pretty pathetic. Um, but this is the best we have. I'm not saying the authors are pathetic, but I'm just saying we just need more data. Um, so this is eight women um, that um, had SCAD. Um, the women in um, blue are um, the women that had SCAD related to pregnancy before. And the, this darker color is a woman that also had fibromuscular dysplasia, which um, Dr. Kim will probably explain, an abnormality of the blood vessels. Um, average time to pregnancy post-SCAD was 18 months. And interestingly, in this study, three of the women were initially misdiagnosed as having, they, they weren't diagnosed that they had SCAD. Um, they actually were told they had spasm. Again, going to the point when we were in training, we had all these women with heart attacks, and we're like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Let's just say it's spasm. So it's kind of a bucket diagnosis. But when Dr. Hayes and her colleagues went back to look at these patients and why they had the heart attacks, three of them actually had SCAD. Of these eight women, two of them had miscarriages. Six patients had live births and, and, were, and were fine. Um, three patients had a C-section as their chosen mode of delivery, three had a vaginal delivery, and only one patient out of the nine had a SCAD nine weeks postpartum. It was a, she was very sick. She had left main involvement. She actually ended up needing um, coronary intervention that was not successful. She went on to bypass surgery, and according to the report, was traumatized by this um, event postpartum. So the best we have is this um, nine-patient um, series to help guide us on um, what would happen if you were, had a SCAD and then wanted to get pregnant again. So contraception after SCAD is also um, a, a topic that if you have had a SCAD, you should discuss with your, um, your physicians for sure. Uh, the last thing we want is for someone who's had SCAD to get pregnant accidentally. Because if we are going to do this, we need to do this uh, understanding, counseling what the risks are and, and how we can maximize your risk before this, before you, if you decide to get pregnant again. Um, Again, because SCAD is related to women, it's related to pregnancy, we assume that SCAD is related to hormones. But there's no direct relationship that we know of between hormone replacement therapy and SCAD. But saying that, we do try to avoid exogenous hormones as much as possible. So if you're looking at contraceptive, um, if you have a single partner, probably the best thing to do is for him to have a vasectomy. Um, you can also consider a tubal ligation. A progesterone IUD, which is, um, has very, very little systemic absorption of hormones, is other, another really good um, uh, choice and is also helpful for heavy bleeding. Um, condoms, um, when not, which are often not used correctly, um, and natural family planning are not reliable, so you need to have really good forms of birth control that you should talk to your physicians about um, after having a SCAD event. Now, IVF or hormone stimulation, um, there's case reports of SCAD occurring with IVF and the, the, the stimulation because, it's, again, it's a hormone-based concept. We stimulate your ovaries to get as many eggs as possible, and that's a hormone thing. And we think hormones are bad for the blood vessels and lead to SCAD. So there are case reports of SCAD happening with IVF. Um, but other than that, we don't, really know, um, we, we don't really know a lot about the safety of IVF. And then menopausal hormone replacements and SCAD. So same concept. SCAD occurs primarily in women. SCAD is associated with pregnancy. Um, there's, a, there's an association with female sex hormones. It's presumed though the relationship is unclear. Again, there's no direct evidence relating hormone contraception or hormone replacement um, to SCAD. But we do like to avoid if possible. 
So if your event occurred on hormones, if you had scan on hormone replacement therapy, we would recommend stopping that. And if you had history scat and now want to talk about hormone replacement therapy, there really are other options out there. We do have menopause um, experts at MGH that can talk about all other things from just making your room colder to antidepressants to gabapentin. There's just lots of other options out there if the symptoms of menopause are, um, are overwhelming for you. Oh, and last thing I want to say is vaginal estrogen is safe. So if you have dry, uh, vaginal estrogen for dryness, you can absolutely use that. There's very little absorption into the, the blood system. So this is a summary of um, my recommendations. So pregnancy post-SCAD is kind of neither happy or sad. We need to counsel, we need to prepare, and we need more data. Um, it is a life-changing recommendation, and most physicians, if just asked up front yes or no, would say no to pregnancy after you've had a SCAD event. But we do understand, um, especially being a woman with children, I do understand that this is life-changing. Contraception post-SCAD um, is a happy face. Um, we have options. We have surgical options for the man. You can have a tubal ligation. You can have an IUD. Um, and we want to avoid oral hormones. And again, we need more data, which is kind of the theme on SCAD. IVF post-SCAD reports of um, SCAD with IVF, so we um, need more data. And the menopausal hormone treatment, we have lots of options. We would avoid hormones um, if we can, um, and there's lots of other non-hormonal and behavior techniques available. Now, one thing I want, do want to tell you is I, I did talk about in the beginning about um, maternal mortality in the United States, which I think is, again, a national embarrassment. And um, I just wanted to briefly touch base about this registry that's going to be created across the United States. It's, it's an, a very unique registry in that it includes maternal fetal medicine specialists, so it's obstetricians and cardiologists coming together to try to solve this problem of heart disease and pregnancy. And this is just a sampling of the centers. We actually have more centers involved now. And it's being spearheaded by a group in Kansas City, Missouri. But at MGH, we're very, very fortunate to be um, part of the steering committee on this as well. So cardiovascular disease is a significant cause of maternal mortality, SCAD, as well as other heart issues during pregnancy. Women who have heart attacks, um, it's not common, but it, there's an increased risk than non-pregnant women of the same age, and SCAD is our most common etiology. Unfortunately, Pregnancy-associated heart attacks are on the rise, and SCAD during pregnancy is higher risk. We need more data, basically. So I really applaud all of you who have been part of registries, um, part of um, you know being part of this process to improve our education on how to improve um, this uh, uh, problem. And again, everything is teamwork. So if you do decide you want to discuss pregnancy, maternal, fetal, um, sorry, hormone replacement therapy, it's teamwork, and we closely collaborate with our colleagues on the OB side um, as well. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So right. we're um, really fortunate. Our next speaker is Dr. Um, Sarah Sierra. And Sarah is really one of the key uh, clinical cardiologists at MGH. She's um, very expert, uh, has a lot of expertise in pregnancy as well as SCAD uh, and the care of women and men with complex cardiovascular disease. And Sarah will be uh, speaking to us on, uh, her topic is really SCAD, the 10,000 foot view. So she's hoping to summarize kind of the key take home points that you need to know about SCAD in general as patients and family members of patients. Um, and then after um, Sarah, we'll be hearing from experts talking about more detailed things like medical management and FMD, et cetera. So Sarah, come on up. Should be all set. Great. Great. Yep. Thank you. Um, great. It's uh, wonderful to be here and to see so many people and so many family members um, supporting uh, some of our SCAD survivors. Um, so again, this will be a summary. I'm going to leave some of the details to speakers who follow me. How do I advance this, Melissa? Um, so I have no disclosures. Um, I am going to share with you a couple of um, cases, but I changed the details of the patient information uh, in case any of them are here, um, just to protect patient identity. <clears throat> um, so as an overview, um, I think we're probably coming at this from different levels. Um, I, I know a lot of you have 
learn a lot about SCAD through your own experience and through your own interest and your own reading, but um, hopefully we'll kind of get all on the same page with this talk. So I'm going to define SCAD and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology, which means sort of what does the typical SCAD patient look like who tends uh, to be affected by this disease. I'm going to talk about the three different SCAD types. Um, some of the conditions associated with SCAD, I have the fibromuscular dysplasia kind of in gray here because that's going to be covered in more detail later. Um, some genetic disorders, <clears throat> and you just talked a little bit about pregnancy. Um, and then again, at the bottom, I'm going to leave the management and the exercise recommendations for some of the speakers uh, who are going to be following me. Um, so what is SCAD? Um, this is just a quick picture of the coronary anatomy, which um, you've probably um, seen as, as you've read about it. Um, the aortic root is here. You have the left main coronary artery there. And then the left anterior descending artery comes down the front. Circumflex artery goes around the back of the heart. And the right coronary artery serves the right. And then, again, the base of the heart and behind. Depends which whether the circumflex dominant in some patients or the right coronary is dominant, depending which side um, serves the back of the heart. So all of you who have had a SCAD, you probably know which coronary vessel was affected, or maybe you had more than one vessel affected. Um, but that's a brief overview of the anatomy. Um, and then we think about what happens when we disrupt the blood flow to the heart. So these little tiny, you know, two, three millimeter vessels supply all of our blood to our heart. Um, and a heart attack is caused by a few different mechanisms shown here. So the first is the typical heart attack you think of when you see on the news. Um, you have a plaque in the wall of the vessel. Usually that's made of cholesterol and some inflammatory cells. If that plaque ruptures for some reason, you develop a thrombus or a clot on top of it, and you can get an occlusion of that artery. You could also get coronary spasm, where the, the muscle cells in the vessels clamp down and decrease blood flow to the heart. Um, or the third way is, is the SCAD. So you have a tear in the wall of the artery or a bleed directly into the wall of the artery, which narrows the vessel and restricts blood flow. Um, and so in, the heart's not getting enough oxygen, not getting enough nutrients. That's the mechanism of the heart attack. So this definition is a spontaneous coronary artery dissection is defined as an epicardial, meaning outside the heart, coronary artery dissection that's not associated with atherosclerosis or, or cholesterol buildup in the artery, or trauma, meaning from a catheter that we did this during a procedure, um, not iatrogenic, um, caused by a physician, essentially. Um, so w what does it look like if we kind of slice through the vessel? So we're looking down at it. You can see you've got this muscular wall. You've got the adventitia, which is connective tissue out here. And then you have what's called the true lumen or the true sort of, you know, barrel of the hose, if you will. Um, intramural hematoma is where you get that bleeding directly into the wall, which then narrows the true lumen. Or you get the tear in the intima or the inner layer, and then you get bleeding into it. So you get the false lumen, which is where there's clot, and then you have the true lumen, which is where the blood is flowing. So if we look at this kind of, you know, this is a histology, um, the, or, or pathology and histology here, you see the false lumen here where there's thrombus in it and the true lumen gets narrowed. And we'll see that again on some angiograms, but this is the up-close view. And then similarly here, you have the, this is the histology. So this is, we took a slice of tissue and put it under a microscope. This is the clot in the false lumen, and then this is the compression of the true lumen. Um, so who gets SCAD? It, it likely accounts for about up to 4% of acute coronary syndromes or heart attacks or sort of unstable chest pain syndromes. Um, it accounts for 35% of heart attacks in women under the age of 50, maybe even more as we continue to recognize it better. Um, and at least 40, over 40% 40 of heart attacks associated with pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> the traditional teaching has been that most women have few traditional risk factors, um, although we are finding in our series that many women do have high cholesterol or high blood pressure. Um, and even though they don't have the typical atherosclerosis, they still may be at risk for SCAD. And then this is just the distribution of the, the ages of patients who come in with SCAD. So, um, I'm not sure what the average age of this audience is, but I, I bet most of you kind of fall into where we sort of see the typical distribution. 
not all of you, obviously, there's some outliers, some very young and some very old, but generally around the ages of 45 to 55 is typical. <clears throat> Um, and, and what do people present with when they have SCAD? I could go around the room and ask everyone what their presenting symptom was. And probably if, if you are like the typical SCAD patients in these series, most of you would have said chest pain. So 96% of patients, almost everyone has chest pain. And about half of those patients, um, that radiates down to the arm. There can be some associated nausea or vomiting. Diaphoresis means sweating. Shortness of breath is dyspnea. Um, back pain, um, and some actually have cardiac arrest, up to seven patients in this series, which is kind of typical or what we've seen, which is VT or VF means ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Those are those dangerous heart rhythms that can cause people to collapse suddenly. <clears throat> um, so these are the three types of SCAD. Um, oops. Should I try to use this pointer. Um, on the, uh, the type one, you can see there's, um, on the top, you have sort of the cartoon pictures. And then down here on the bottom, we have the actual catheterization. So up here, where we have the cartoon, you can see there's a little bit of um, dye that gets hung up in that false lumen. And so when we actually look at the angiogram, you have the vessel coming down nice and smooth, normal size. And then it suddenly tapers or gets smaller. And you can see where I have the arrow pointing there. There's a little bit of dye that gets stuck in the false lumen. So it gets in there, and then it doesn't wash out right away. So that's a type 1 SCAD when you see that dye there. That affects about 25% of patients. The most typical is this, um, the type 2 SCAD. Um, and this is where you have the normal vessel coming down here, like I showed you in the cartoon. And then you get this sudden narrowing, this little tiny vessel. You know, it should be more the size like, like you see down here or up here. And then you just have this little tiny bit of blood flow going down there. That's type 2. And then type 3 actually looks a lot like our typical atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease. And it can actually be hard to distinguish if you're just doing the straight up angiogram. So how do I know this isn't an 80-year-old man who's coming in with chest pain? You can't necessarily tell whether this is plaque in the wall or this is just a focal dissection um, unless you use intracoronary imaging. And that's where we put actually down into the artery a little um, camera, either an ultrasound or a CAT scan, kind of like a mini CAT scan, um, and we can actually see the tear of the vessel. And I think I have a couple of pictures of that coming up. So this, we need intracoronary imaging to distinguish, and that's a type 3 SCAD. Um, so this is the intracoronary imaging that I was talking about. So. Um, uh, letter A is the OCT or optical coherence tomography, kind of like a CAT scan. And you can actually see where the arrow is pointing. That's a, a little tear in the wall of the vessel, the big circle kind of right here. That's the actual the camera going in. And then you see this tear in this vessel wall here. So then you've got the false lumen here where that star is, and then the true lumen is down here. Um, and then the second one is the ultrasound. So the intravascular ultrasound, again, showing this compression, this is the, the false lumen here, compressing the true lumen, which is this little tiny star there. Um, so what are the predisposing conditions and situations? There's a couple that were, um, were exemplified in that last case. Um, so there's triggers um, for FMD, and we think sometimes this is a surge in adrenaline, um, which is that stress hormone that you get when it's sort of fight or flight response that can lead to kind of increase the sudden raising of the blood pressure, raising of the heart rate, and increased shear forces or kind of pressure against those arteries, um, which can lead to vascular injury. So things that cause that adrenaline trigger, that stress hormone to be released, is severe emotional stress. Um, among our patients, we found that to be present in about 40% of patients. Um, very vigorous physical activity, um, about a quarter of our patients. And again, I don't know if there's any men with SCAD in the audience, um, or if you are all supporting the women in the audience. Um, but we found that vigorous physical exercise was more common among men who presented with SCAD. Um, and then cocaine or energy drinks um, also cause that sudden raising of blood pressure and heart rate. So those are kind of the pre precipitating events. Now, not everybody who has severe emotional stress or exercises vigorously will get a SCAD. So what is it, what causes SCAD in some people and not others? Um, oh, and sorry, hormone exposure as another trigger. Um, we think there's a vascular vulnerability. So 
Um, we already heard about pregnancy in the postpartum state. There's probably something about the estrogen, whether it leads to a little bit of breakdown of the connective tissue, um, or whether the pregnancy itself is just increased um, sort of stress um, due to the increased plasma volume or blood vessel volume. That's part of it probably too. Um, fibromuscular dysplasia is the most common vascular abnormality that we've seen. Um, and then there's some other genetically mediated abnormal vessels. So vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan syndrome, Loewy-Dietz syndrome, those are some other hereditary conditions. Um, and then rheumatologic disorders, probably there's an association. So lupus, um, polyarteritis nodosa, hypereosinophilia, those conditions. So it's probably the combination of these two things, an underlying vulnerability and then perhaps a stressor or a trigger um, that leads to the SCAD. Yeah? Sure. I don't remember. I think post, but I don't remember. Um, so uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, again, we diagnose it with a CAT scan of the head, neck, abdomen, and pelvis, just because those are the vessels that it tends to commonly affect, so the kidney arteries, the iliac arteries, and then the carotid arteries, and then we look for abnormalities in the cerebral vasculature. <clears throat> um, if we don't find fibromuscular dysplasia, which tends not to have a genetic cause, at least that we've identified yet, um, then we consider genetic testing. Um, so again, this is just a whole bunch of series showing how prevalent is um, fibromuscular dysplasia. And you can see it varies across different um, studies, um, but it's, it's um, patients in the dark bars were found to have fibromuscular dysplasia. So there's some series where it was as little as 11% and others where it was almost close to 90%. So it's a, it's a wide range, and it also probably has to do with how hard you're looking and how, how um, good your radiology department is at diagnosing it. Because I think, as Melissa might have mentioned or people will talk about later, I think when we've looked at patients in our series, even if we don't see classic fibromuscular dysplasia, we see subtle abnormalities, whether it's a little bit of vascular dilation or something else. So I, again, I think that probably explains some of the wide variability in these studies. Um, and then we have an expert here, um, Dr. Mark Lindsay, who um, we often refer patients to for genetic testing. Um, and the, the yield is pretty low, I'll have to say. It, it, um, there was a large study out there that looked at 412 cases of SCAD, and they looked back. And it was only about 1% of the patients in that series who actually had a family history of SCAD. And, and that's been my experience. I think most people that come in, they're the first family member, and they don't have other family members with SCAD. Um, <clears throat> if there is a family history of it, then we certainly get much more worried um, about a genetic predisposition and would have a stronger consideration for genetic testing. Um, so this is, this is um, borrowed from Dr. Lindsay. Um, he, this is sort of his way of thinking about it. So all the patients with SCAD are in that blue circle. And then there's probably a small number who have these genetic conditions down here in the yellow. And then probably a larger number who have fibromuscular dysplasia. But we haven't really found that the yellow circle and the green circles really overlap. Um, so maybe 30%, maybe 60%. I think the jury's out on that exact number. And then maybe about 5% of people with SCAD will have some sort of genetic mutation when we've tested them. Um, so, so Dr. Lindsay's strategy has been that in, if, if definitive fibromuscular dysplasia has been found, then he feels that the genetic testing is, is fairly unfruitful and, and low yield. So unless there's a strong family history or some other compelling reason to send genetic testing off, he typically doesn't. Um, the genetic testing would be encouraged if you have a family history of an aneurysm or dissection or there's coexisting dilation of the aorta, the main blood vessel in the heart, um, or other sort of vascular manifestations that we might find on physical exam. Um, there's certain facial appearances of patients who have Marfan syndrome, for example. Um, and then these are some of the tests that he tends to send off, and so I won't go into detail on those, um, but they're associated with sort of various um, vascular abnormalities. Um, and then the most common one was this call 3A1, and so that's really the one that he strongly encourages um, testing for. 
Um, so other conditions, um, just to touch briefly on these, um, fibrovascular dysplasia being the most common. Then there's other systemic inflammatory conditions, other connective tissue disorders, hormone therapy, postpartum, multiparity, meaning more than four births, um, grand multiparity, meaning more than five births, um, and grand multigravita, more than five pregnancies, and then other idiopathic means we just don't know. And obviously, I think that's been a little bit of the theme of today. There's still a lot of unanswered questions that we're trying to answer. <clears throat> so pregnancy-associated SCAD, um, I think that what this graph is showing here, when does it tend to happen? The most common time is zero to five weeks. And then this red bar is, is the first week. So I would say the majority happen within the first week after pregnancy. That's what we more typically see. And of those, half occur within the first week after pregnancy. The other one's later. It's a little bit of a tailing out here, but there's still you know, a fair number that happen um, farther out from pregnancy. Um, and what we found, again, sort of leading us to think that there's probably a hormonal component, is that if you look at patients who have had a SCAD and then you compare them to the rest of sort of the U.S. population, they are more likely to be older, they're more likely to have multiple childbirth, more likely to have been treated for infertility, and more likely to have had preeclampsia compared to the general population. Actually, I should say, just to point out, that didn't come out to be significant. The trend is a little bit older, though. <clears throat> um, and briefly about pregnancy-associated SCAD, um, the coronary artery or hematoma or tear limits blood flow, as we talked about. Um, compared to non-pregnancy-associated SCAD, um, it tends to be a little bit higher risk. Um, the pregnancy-associated SCADs are tend to be older at the time of their first childbirth and frequently have a history of multiple pregnancies, as I said. Um, and they tend to have fewer extra coronary vascular abnormalities. So it's sort of like if you're, if you're uh, have pre pregnancy-related SCAD, we don't necessarily have to invoke a second um, sort of predisposing condition. It may have been the pregnancy and you may not have fibromuscular dysplasia or some other vascular abnormality attention, and um, this is a, just as many of the collaborators that we work with, I wanted to recognize all of them, and not the least of which is our patients who are really helping to uh, move the uh, disease forward. So thank you.